Hi, good morning, all. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. How are you all? Good, good thank you. Excited. Wonderful. Great. Happy great. International Women's good to Day. Be here. Yes. Happy International Women's Day I, to I call all. it Happy International Women. And you too, and you too. It's like a whole week because I've been speaking every single yes. day. Oh my good God, Women's yes. Um, we have Actually, had events. So we have had events every single day this week. So, yeah, um, welcome back everyone um, to the Equality Leaders Women's Summit and our virtual table to share how we are being the change that we want to see. Today, we're celebrating powerful women, learn how they are navigating their way through challenges to smash that glass ceiling, how they are using the platforms of privilege and making it work, and the thing we are all perhaps suffering from, but we don't necessarily talk about it, imposter syndrome. Can we perhaps just go around the table and just introduce ourselves and um, share with everybody who we are and how we self-identify? Um, maybe I'll go first. I'm Manakshi Mystery, CEO and founder of Equality Leaders, and um, my pronouns are she and her. Um, Kelly, you're next to me on the virtual table. Shall I come to you next? Thanks. Um, good morning. My name is Kelly Maidley. Um, I am one of the uh, Centre for Expertise Directors at Direct Line uh, and I'm responsible for uh, culture, uh, diversity and inclusion and all things talent acquisition and future skills. Thank you, Kelly. Diana? Yes, um, so good morning everyone. So very nice to be here. So I'm Diana Johnson um, and I'm the HI and Inclusion Director at BAT, um, professional coach. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm very passionate about this topic. So I'm very happy to be here and share, you know, with other uh, amazing um, women and, and, and discuss. So thanks for the invite. Welcome. Ritika. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Minakshi. Such an honor to be on stage with these phenomenal women that I can see on my screen. And really, thank you to the audience for tuning in. Uh, I'm Ritika Vatwa. I'm the director of uh, UK operations for the Cultural Intelligence Centre. Um, and I also sit on the advisory board for British Transport Police. And I'm, I'm a mentor for the BT Ethnically Diverse uh, Programme. So, yeah, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Likewise, Joan. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me along today. Great to be with some other phenomenal women. My name's um, Joan Myers. I'm a, a coach and mentor. I do career coaching and also I'm a director and trustee for the Florence Nightingale Foundation. Good to be here today. Thank you, Joan. Um, Ritika, maybe I can come to you first. Um, you've got a very inspirational story to share. Your journey to where you are today. You were born and brought up in India's patriarchal society as a woman of colour, an immigrant. Can you share with us your story of how you got to where you are today? Because some of the work that you are doing is absolutely phenomenal. And give an example of how you've broken biases across the different countries that you've, countries and continents that you've lived in. Oh my God. <laughs> Where do you start, how right? How many times have you heard my story this week? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, there we go. So yes, uh, I mean, in a nutshell, really being born and brought up as a woman in India, my journey really started on the day I was born where my grandmother was like, oh my God, a woman, a girl's been born in the family, but at least she's not dark skinned. So there's some hope in the future for her. I mean, gosh, how much is wrong with that, right? Um, so you know, the bias started from there and then not being allowed to work because it would bring shame on the family, uh, moving to, to outside India, where at least I felt I fit in, even though I was a woman, sadly. Um, outside of India, I became a woman of color, which, which brought its own challenges because I just didn't feel like I fit in or belonged. Um, so, you know, breaking biases has pretty much been the norm until now when 
during the pandemic, I decided I didn't want to do this anymore. I sort of just allowed everything to happen, didn't realize I was breaking the biases by just not uh, fitting in or doing what was expected to do every moment of my, well, day, my life. And, um, you know, I, I sort of went on a inward journey, found a coach, found my passion, found a job that lends to my passion. And, um, and that to me is breaking the glass ceiling because I didn't know whether it would get to this point where I would find the passion and be able to lend myself. But my God, it has been the most beautiful experience in the last few months of, you know, just being able to bring yourself to work not having to cover any part of your identity is just so liberating in so many ways. And what that does to the work that you do, it's just, it's, it's mind boggling. So as an advocate, you know, I'm just like, well, in terms of how I've done that is, is finding those allies, is finding those mentors, those coaches, those sponsors that would be, that would have my back and believe in me even when the world didn't. So, you know, I think at the crux of it, as hard as it feels, believing in self does, does beautiful wonders. And I, I wouldn't recommend that high enough, no matter how hard that feels. Thank you for sharing that, Ritika. And, I, I, you know, you and I have had this conversation on many times. And, you know, we, we spoke about, we speak about privilege, you know, and, you know, we both didn't understand that we both had privilege. And I want to come back to you on that point in a moment, but I want to go over to Diana next. Diana, hi, welcome from uh, the sunny shores of oh. South Africa. Yes, Cape Town looks amazing today. Blue oh, skies. London is not bad too here today, so it's a good day. Um, Diana, British American Tobacco is passionate about ownership, accountability, and empowering leaders to keep the business moving. As HRD and Inclusion Director at BAT, how are you using your position of power to shape accountability and ownership? What are you doing that is different? What are you doing that is breaking the bias? Uh, yes, and I, and I think I, I think there's many things, but I think, um, you know, I just came from a... Um, an amazing session that we are doing this morning. So I think mm. it's a very good example on how we make this happen truly. So today we we, um, we kind of reserved our morning to talk about our ambitions and our strategy in, you know, in, in the cluster we lead here in Africa. And mm. we did that in a, a kind of a Star Trek um, a look and feel. So I even have my Star Trek button here. Uh, so we had all the leaders in the business together virtually uh, looking at our ambitions and diversity and inclusion was there in the heart and center in terms of what is our unique and individual commitment to diversity and inclusion as leaders in this company. So it's not only about the numbers and gender, but how do we really make sure we are creating the space and uh, the inclusivity uh, for diversity? So we were talking about diversity of opinions, diversity of interests, diversity of background, of color, of gender, of nature, of home country, you know, I'm from Brazil. Um, so I think the way um, we are doing that in BT and which I'm very proud of, you know, to be leading the function ahead of this is that we are very open and transparent. Uh, but at the same time, we are very deliberate on what we want to achieve. So it's not about um, a nice statement that we look at it and we find it beautiful. All of us as leaders, we have KPIs on diversity that we need to achieve, um, a glad path on the future that we want to see um, and how we're going to get there. So for me is, you know, the ambitions are there, the KPIs and the numbers are there. The how is, you know, the leadership um, team uh, which own, with their own functions, they are free uh, to think of different ways and, and, and bring that inclusivity to life. Uh, but we have very clear KPIs because with, um, with no numbers, you can't uh, measure. And, um, and we are very, uh, you know, uh, we believe truly that you need to put an ambition there uh, to make sure we get there. Um, and we are very ahead. Um, so we are very proud of, you know, the numbers today. We are even publishing it externally. So we're getting to a point uh, to all our managerial levels. We are now at 40% on female representation, which is huge. We, we started at 20 something. 
And we are now, you know, we are opening 2022 with 40% uh, with our 50% ambition uh, close by. So we are, we are sure we're going to close it uh, before our, our kind of deadline that we impose ourselves. Um, and for me, the most um, grateful part is to hear our leaders saying, it's not about being happy to achieve a number, but is to see how powerful the teams are on having, you know, the balance and the quality and how we are making sure we are seeing the results coming with the diversity. So that's so powerful. Um, and I think this is the way we are empowering our leaders to uh, to get there and talk about DNI so openly. Thank you for sharing that. That's really powerful. What you're what you're doing. Can I just ask everyone if they if, um, if you're not speaking, if you can keep your mics on mute because there's some background noise coming from someone. I'm not quite sure. I'm sorry, Dana. Coming back to you, why is this piece of work so important to you on a personal level? I, I think it touches me um, in, in several levels, right? Um, so just saying that I'm a woman, I don't think it's that it's a lot. Um, it's it's talking about you know my background and where my mom came from. Um, and I always say that you know, and being in Africa, I think it's a privilege for me. And bringing my three years old daughter with me, and what she's experiencing from a cultural point of view, I think it's something she's going to take for life. Um, and then I come from a country, right? So Brazil is still a country where racism is still very strong, which for me is very sad. Um, and it's still um, spoken about you know a part of the society that seems that it's uh, far away from you which you know I, I really don't understand and I come to a continent where of course there's still a lot of things you know under you know the carpet especially on, on, on in South in South Africa but for me you know I, I use that as an example so I have um, my three years old at school and um, her best friend um, yes is, is black and, uh, you know, and they have the same, you know, kind of uh, they go with the same dress and she just looks at me and say, you know, they are twins. Um, and then but for me, coming from a country where this is still very, you know, very heavy and you still you still see very, you know, a lot of violence around uh, racism and everything. And just raising a daughter that looks at that and um, sees differently and sees that, you know, what, what matters your color? What matters where you come from? What matters your gender? It doesn't matter. What matters is the value you bring um, to life and to the table. So that way it touches me in a very personal way. Um, and for me, uh, what I do at work has a value that I want her, her at home when she gets bigger to look at me and see, look, my mom is doing everything that she can to make this world better for me. So I don't want her to go to a workplace and see inequality or see that she needs to fight for a place. I strongly believe that in 15 years when she's entering the market or whatever she's choosing to do, she would look at a different world where, you know, I did my little part to help it get better. So that's where it touched me. Oh, thank you, Diana. Thank you for being you and thank you for um, thank you for what you do. You really inspired me today. Thank you. Um, Kelly, coming over to you. Welcome to the summit. Um, Direct Line has done some incredible, incredible work to build a diverse workforce. I mean, I've had many conversations with your head of diversity and inclusion, Raj Mojaria, you know, and it allows everyone to develop their full potential. Um, can you share an intervention that the group came up with to increase representation of women in leadership roles? Yeah, definitely. Um you know, I think it's fair to say that we've been we have actually been doing quite a few things, um, and actually one one thing it hasn't sort of um, completely shifted uh, the the dial here. You know, we've been doing lots of things around uh, changing our processes, thinking about how we uh, how we recruit right through to how we support women and um, development programs and all of those sorts of things. But but actually, one of the things that is really dear to my heart um, is uh, we we set up a couple of years ago. Uh, myself and another senior colleague uh, in the organization we set up our uh, what we call thrive and and thrive was actually um something that that katie and i did off the side of our desk uh really just because we we'd been to a, a summit pretty much like this uh, a few years ago and we sat there and we realized just how much opportunity we'd been afforded um actually in our workplace and having uh, been sponsored uh, and, and and having the opportunity to go to things uh, like this today 
And we just we sat there and we thought, how do we pay this forward into an organisation uh, where not everybody's got that opportunity, um, not everybody's afforded that. Um, and so what can we do uh, to, to, to try and pay forward some of our own experiences, give some of our own time um, and how we can support some of the women that are coming up through the organisation that we want to promote, to support uh, and to develop. And so we set Thrive up a couple of years ago and, and Thrive is, it, you know, is a, a community of women who are doing exactly that they are paying forward their experiences we put on lots of events uh, we get lots of external speakers to come in we try and support training development uh, for all different levels of, of people within the organization not just women now it's it's now extended into um out you know across the organization entirely but um it's been an initiative that um has grown arms and legs for want of a better expression because so many people uh, really feel affiliated to, to supporting uh, and to helping and, and, and people want to get in and start supporting some of the events um, and we've seen so many women um, really benefit from from some of those uh, from some of those sessions and we've run things from you know how do you how do you present yourself how do you um, you know how do you stand up and uh, and talk in front of a group of people you know and it's things like just finding your voice um, and, and being heard uh, right through to how do you you know in, increase your uh, your influence what's your uh, your elevator pitch if you uh, if you've got that opportunity to to be speaking to somebody and actually how do you how do you really reach your potential even like you know when a lot of us don't feel like we're quite ready um we're not you know we're not at that exact level we've not you know we've not mastered all of those things therefore I couldn't possibly apply for that job where they're pushing some of those women to to just go for it um and uh, giving them some support around uh, you know how they might do that how they show up um and not to worry about all the other things and the voices and 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 um you know why they shouldn't and actually give them the reasons why they should um and it's like I say it's gone from strength to strength um Penny our, our CEO uh, often joins us um in those events and, and talks of our own experiences and I think that's the other thing you know we we've getting support from everywhere but it's some of that's coming from the top as well thank you Kelly for sharing that and I'd actually like to come back to a point that you made about imposter syndrome but let me come over to Joan first and then we'll come back onto the piece around when we just don't believe in ourselves why is it why are women doing that let's we'll talk about imposter syndrome in a moment welcome Joan um hi good morning um Joan you've worked in the healthcare sector for over 35 hi. years now sorry can everyone hear me yeah, okay Perfect. Joan, you've worked in the healthcare sector for over 35 years, a multi-award winning, inspirational, you're a nurse, you're a leader. Um, you're now using your platform to support education and food sponsorship. Can you tell us why this piece of work is so important to you and how did it, how did it all come about? Well, um, as a nurse for nearly 36 years, um, about 20 years ago, I went to Kenya on a mission trip. And it's easy to sort of say, I love you, God loves you, everybody loves you. But I just felt that we need to demonstrate the love of God in action. And I decided mm. to sponsor one little girl. And that was 20 years ago in next month, it'd be 20 years ago. Now, from that, I've got over 25 children being sponsored from nursery school all the way up to teen. Many of them have left school now, one's um, studying law, one, the, the very first girl I sponsored, she told me when she was 18, she was three and a half at the time, when she was 18, she told me that I was her greatest role model and she wanted to be like me. And so she wanted to be a nurse and she's just completing a nurse training now in Kenya. This all took place in Kenya and she would have qualified last year, but because of the pandemic, she wasn't able to finish last year. And then there's others doing project management, cosmopology. These are children in some area that had no opportunity to progress because they live, live in very poor families and we just provide food and sponsorships. And all I did was ask some friends, would you sponsor this child, told us it cost, and all the money goes directly to those families. And I go over every year, at least once or twice a year, have Christmas parties for them or birthday parties. And I'm going, I'm going in April with a team of 10 and we've bought land now. We've got to do a medical mission, evangelism mission, and everything for the people in the community. 
there. So that's my greatest passion to see the transition and change and the improvement you can make in people's lives just by stepping up faith and just doing one little action has a mega effect on so many people's lives. And the, I was only able to land in Kenya through the young guy that I sponsored to do law. And because he met all the right people, all the right people in place, so we was able to purchase the land. And now it's a committee out there actually administrating everything on the land. Because my aim is to build, a um, not a children's home, but a health centre, a school and a church and a, re a refuge children to come to have food and drink in the daytime. And it would happen to those children, those very same children. That is so inspiring. Congratulations for achieving so much. And, and, and did you experience challenges and barriers along the way? And if so, could you share some of those? Um, the main barriers are because I don't come from England and my parents come from the West Indies. So I don't speak Swahili. And so they, I look like them. It's only when I open my mouth and speak, <laughs> they realise that I'm not Kenyan. So often the prices will help. So something will cost five shillings will suddenly cost five hours they hear my voice. So that, that's the main challenge. But what I do, I, I've never been able to learn the language either, even though Swahili is supposed to be really easy to learn. But I always have people with me interpreting for me and helping me along the way. Um, otherwise, the the young people, they're just really passionate. They want to learn. They're so grateful. And for me, it's so fulfilling to see when they progress and do so well. And what was really inspiring was one of the young guys, when it was his, his birthday, he decided to use his birthday money to buy food and drink for the children in the village we grew up oh. because that's the way to do it in helping other people so pay forward and supporting others in the same condition that they were in. Yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing that. That's just like and maybe really over in in touching. I was just going to say in England, then we'd have people in England saying, why are you helping poor people in Africa? There's poor people in England. And then people from Jamaica would say, why are you helping people in Africa? You should be helping people from Jamaica because your parents come from. But I said, it doesn't really matter. Everybody's, everybody's important. It's wherever your heart is. That's where you need to be operating and working. You shouldn't be working in silos like that. Yeah, and it is about our hearts and minds, isn't it? You know, when we're driving this this kind of work, we've got to be, it's got to come from within our heart. No, but thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I want to come back to the piece around imposter syndrome for us to have a, a conversation on that. You know, imposter syndrome puts the blame on individuals. You know, I, I quite often feel it's it's my problem, it's me. Um, you know, directing our view towards fixing the individual instead of challenging the places that where we work. Um, in your own personal experiences, what are your own experiences of imposter syndrome and how have you overcome that, if at all, um, and that sense of not belonging and that self-doubt? And that's a question to, to you all. Um, maybe, Ritika, I can come to you first. Sure. Thanks, Minakshi. I, you know, again, I, I might, uh, I want to jump the barrel a little bit on this one where as a woman of color, it goes way beyond imposter syndrome. It wasn't just that you self-doubt yourself, which might be natural or not, depending on each individual's journey. It's that spaces around us were not given to us. What was due is, well, why us? I'm, you know, I, I might just speak for myself, but uh, I think I'm speaking for um, marginalized folk where we weren't given the dues. So the constant micro, the relentless microaggressions, the relentless systemic racism uh, based on nothing but your gender and color of skin and whatever else means it just adds to that self-doubt that we might or might not have as humans. So, uh, you know, in a particular organization where I, did, I, I was deliberately excluded it made such a big dent on my confidence for such a long time. And I always thought it was me until I came out of that. And I'm able to look back at it with a different lens now. And I'm thinking it wasn't me because this is me. I still haven't changed. But I'm thriving as an individual right now for two reasons. One is the belief in self. 
which took a lot of hard work to get to that point. I cannot reiterate enough that it does take hard work, but we have to believe that our differences are an asset and each of us are unique and different. And so that self-belief of my unique differences is what has got me to the point where no such thing as uh, imposter syndrome, no such thing as I don't belong in this space. I own this space for who I am, what I bring to the table, my perspective. And as long as I believe in that, whether the, the rest of the people do or not, I don't really care. But it seems like they do. So I think it all just starts from self. And, and you know, it is, I, I will, I, you know, I, it is hard work. It's easier said than done, but you need to just keep at it surround yourself with people that love you believe in you uh, for what you stand for and it'll come oh that that is that feels really really personal and um i think women are just conditioned you know from a very young age to behave the way we now do not believing in ourselves and perhaps not challenging ourselves and not calling out as well right you know, we don't do enough of that. Um, thank you, Ratika, for sharing that. Um, Can I just, sorry, you know, I'm terribly yeah, sorry, sure. but, you know, talking yeah. about belief in self, but I think a lot of us are parents on the call and I have two young daughters and pretty much every day on their way to school, I will say there is nothing you can't achieve if you put your mind to it. And that includes the three-year-old. There is nothing. This morning I sat down, you're beautiful, you're intelligent, you're kind, you're compassionate. There is nothing in this world that you can't achieve. And so that being drilled constantly as parents, as society, the whole I can't be a scientist or I can't be a footballer, that's all that bias, mm. uh, you know. Yes. So Yeah, and that's a really great example. I mean, we were just talking about at the previous session on some, you know, the conversation needs to start also at our kitchen table and that, you know, maybe that walk to school or it may be at bath time or it may be at bedtime, you know, just to ensure that we pass these messages on to our children from a, a very young age is just so important. And it sits with us as parents as well, right, that responsibility. Thank you for sharing that, Ratika. Um, Diana, if I may come to you. Yeah, and I think Ritika, that was you know very you know very strong. I think I think for me, um, one thing that I learned to do. Um, so I remember you know the first time I moved to this um, you know the first kind of you know director role, and I moved to Kenya. So it was you, you know it's, it's your first everything. You know your your first assignment, first um, really top team uh, role, and you know moving abroad with you know a baby. She was not even she was what ten months. Um, and then you're just saying, you know, why me, right? Oh my God, will I, you know, looking after you know, 16 countries and it, it, and then you start with, you know, that thing of, you know, you're not capable or, or what, what the hell you're doing. Um, but one very strong thing that I learned from one of my mentors that says, you know, whenever that starts, uh, before it gets bigger, um, just choose, you know, four or five people around you and, and ask the question. So, you know, ask my husband, why do you think, you know, they sent me here? And then the things that you hear from, you know, your your husband, your family, um, you can ask your even your 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 previous boss or current boss, or even my mentor saying, you know, why did you choose me to go? And then when they start reinforcing a bit of, you know, why it was you and what is your strength and why do we believe in you and that's why you're there. So don't doubt yourself any minute. You just kind of, you know, you kind of you guys know, just say, okay, um, so wow, I, I I can do it, right? And then they reinforce some things that you, uh, and I think that we are, sometimes we are shy uh, just to look in our mirror and and realize, yes, we are good in, in A, B, and C, and, and yes, and why not? Um, and what's wrong about, you know, acknowledging that we are good um, and that and it may be better than other men or even, you know, so why not? Um, so that's a kind of a powerful tool that I have. So before it even gets bigger or it, it um it stops me from anything. I just ask four or five people and, you know, tell me, what do you think? Why do you think I'm here? Or I was given this or, um, and then the things you hear, um, you know, uh, just, you know, lifts you up and you just say, you know what, this is just my mind playing tricks. Um, there's nothing to be scared. There's nothing to doubt. Um, you, you can make it. 
Um, so whenever um, one of you, you know, in the call, or whatever feels that in your personal life, or you know, I'm being, I'm becoming a mom, so why? And you know, I'm, I am incapable, or a new job, or a new role. Just ask people, um, and I'm sure you will hear wonderful things about yourself that sometimes you know, sometimes you don't know enough, and I'm sure it will bring back, you know, your confidence. So um, don't hide from it. Go for it. I really like that. Just go for it. There's nothing that can stop us. Thank you, Diana. Kelly, if I may come over to you. Um, yeah, so I've, I've got a, a, a similar sort of um, thing to Diana. I remember actually joining a, an organisation and um, just finding myself in a position where culturally the organisation wasn't right for me. Um, it was a very male-dominated, very traditional big drinking culture. Uh, I am talking a few years ago, but you know, I had a, a young family. Um, and I, I, I just remember, you know, feeling like not my authentic self, trying to be something I wasn't to try and fit in. And the more I tried to fit in, the more I couldn't fit in, um, because it just wasn't right for me. And actually, uh, Ratika, you talk a bit about microaggression and actually some of the worst experiences I've had actually are from female bosses um, being, you know, showing that that microaggression, not being supportive, not, you know, not not helping, um, you know, women when when they need really when they need help. Um, and I remember sitting on the kitchen floor in my house crying uh, and my what then was three year old daughter coming and sitting on the floor with me and saying, mummy, whatever it is, it's going to be OK. Um, and it broke my heart. And I just at that point thought no job's worth this because now I'm not doing I'm not being a parent as well as I could be. And I'm not doing this thing at, at work as, as, as good as I should be because I'm trying to be something I'm not and this culture is not right for me and it's it's toxic and it's it's not helping me and um and actually just taking some of that control back um and realizing what is within your control what is you know what you can do about some of that stuff um and you know I, I left the organization um and but I was very honest when I left and that took a lot of bravery actually to say what I felt particularly about some of the aggression that I'd felt from from a very senior female boss um and actually some of the things that you said you know surrounding yourself but with people that love you that care that sponsor you that that want to see you succeed but actually I think the biggest thing for me at that point was realizing the type of leader that I wanted to be um, and how uh, it's so important to you know if you if you've been a, given some of those opportunities is how do you pass some of that down how do you how do you make sure that you're there to support the people that um, you know are in your team or working with you or for you um, and actually you know and you've all said it already you know being a role model I've got two girls as well um, I want them them to feel proud of me I want them to see that I'm a role model and, and that you can have a voice and that you should be heard um, and you know like you guys I tell my girls every single day be unique and be yourself um, and find your voice and use it oh thank you for sharing that and I think we're living in this era of yeah well why can't we have it on our terms and why can't we create our own rules we can you know we're living in this age of flexibility is also the key to what women want you know and COVID has just been an absolute um uh, godsend for us um Joan may I come to you next yeah I remember when I well, after I qualified as a nurse in the regional hospital I went to a big hospital and somebody asked me how how was I what was I doing there, um, and I said well I applied when I got the job and they said you must have blue eyes, and at the time I didn't actually know what that meant and what was really I think many times through the NHS I was like the own one of black nurses in senior positions because most black nurses started as enrolled nurse I started as a registered nurse because that's what my mother told me to do so I was always in senior positions as made sometimes the only black person amongst white people so I had no problem with that I always say that I stand out because I'm outstanding so I was to flip it the other way but I remember when I became a nurse consultant and I was in the nurse consultant network of about 10 different nurse consultants from different areas and they were all talking about all the things that they did and their roles and everything and I was actually 
And by the time they came around to me and I was doing, I said, I think I'm, in, I'm an imposter. I shouldn't be here. And the reason why I said that, I was new in post and I was comparing myself with all these other senior nurses that had been in position for a very long time and had built up their portfolio and were doing absolutely fantastic things. But now I look back years later, if they'd asked me around that time, I was doing exactly the same that they have the syndrome sometimes about us comparing ourselves to other people and wanting to be like other people or trying to become something that we're not. And often we're not really imposters. We just think that we're imposters because our self-talk, I think Rafiq talked about it, our self-talk, we talk to ourselves and say that we're not good enough. And we tell ourselves, and I think Diana said it as well, often we think, I can't be that good. Maybe I think I'm good, but I'm not that good. And it's to seek validation from other people. You must believe in yourself as well. So I, I have a saying, I say everywhere I go to everyone, I hope you're saying it, that you are one of a kind, right from God's mind, a divine design. And there's no one like you, this earth. you're not just one in a you're one in 7.8 billion. And if you were not here, the world would not be the same without you. You're here for a reason, just for a season, not for life. But while you have life, make sure you leave a legacy for life. And the only way to do that is to have a vision and to fulfill it. Just be who you are. That, that, that's lovely. Um, and you know what, uh, Joan, you must send that to me and I'd love to share that with our community. Um, and I think life just conditions us just not to believe in ourselves, right? And from a very young age and, and, and therefore we have all these barriers as we go to school and you know, um, decide, decide on our career choices and so on. Um, I'd like us to talk about privilege for a moment, but before we do that, um, I've actually got a couple of questions that have come through off our virtual floor. Um, the first one is to Ritika, actually. Um, Ritika, you urge us to find our allies, find our community, find our mentors. How did you go about doing this? by actively seeking them so literally in organizations where i would be the only one that looked like me mm. i would look around that room and out of nothing but a gut sense feel that this person could support me and i'd literally ask them can you have coffee with me and then straight out mm. would you be my mentor can you be my sponsor there was no other way out and you know that was that has really hold me, held me to stead in many situations on board levels, especially with senior stakeholders, where within that room, I've managed to get two people that are invested in me because I asked them. And so that was, that was one way that I sort of garnered support for myself and I didn't see it happening, obviously. Uh, and then, you know, the rule of the trusted five, that's what we're all talking about. Make yeah. that list of your trusted five and, and the example that I hold on in my head is let's just, just think for a second that you're hanging off a cliff. Which five people would you want standing on the other end of that cliff that can save your life? Colloquially, colloquially, you get the word, <laughs> hypothetically and in, in the real sense, right? It isn't just about the physical power. It's about people that can, that you feel can save you. So, you know, you've got that list of those, those go-to people. Um, and even now, I'm always actively within the industry, outside the industry, seeking sponsors, those that will talk about me when I'm not in the room. And I'm always actively doing that. So so it's, it's again, down to us, right, to create our circle, to create those allies, yeah. to create those sponsors and, and, uh, uh, and, and have those people around us that whether we force them to believe in us over a period of time or whether we just do it with a trusted relationship. Uh, yeah, and it, it's, that, it's that bold, it's being brave, it's being courageous to make that first move, right? Perfect. Thank you, Ritika, for sharing, sharing that. I've got another question that's coming in. I'm going to open it up to the floor. Anyone can um, answer this. It's from Tim Hardy Lennick from CSG. Accepting positive praise can be hard, what tips does the panel have 
for actively hearing the good things said and embracing that. Anybody like to take that question? Yeah, I, I think I can jump in, right? So I think, you know, even when I go to some of, you know, my um, our Women in Leadership forums here, it, it comes, uh, that kind of question or comment comes, right? So, mm. and especially us. So remember the last one who gave you a praise or something or um, in terms of you, you look nice or you did a good job. Normally what we do, we kind of, or we don't even listen and say, uh, and then we move, right? Yeah. Um, and then what we tell, um, especially our female leaders, is that, you know, first thing, um, you know, as an automatic response, say thank you, right? So so thank you. And um, and then normally what we also uh, suggest is that when you hear that, um, uh, if, you know, if you have the form or the time, uh, it's always good that you say, you know, um, thank you. And, and, and by the way, um, um, can you give me an example of, you know, another day or another thing that you saw that same behavior on me? So, you know, try to double click on it uh, to give you more examples on, you know, when um, you saw that. Or, and then the other one we also give is that um, there's no um, receiving without giving. Um, so, you know, give back something. So if you hear really something very nice and, and say thank you and you double click, you know, just give back something nice. So and say, you know, by the way, um, it was not today, but the other the day, you know, the other thing you did in that meeting or the other thing you did uh, that I saw you developing some of your team, it was so great. And I really wanted to, uh, you know, to recognize you on that one. So there's no receiving without giving. So also, you know, be mindful on um, double clicking on what it is and asking more examples, uh, but doing the same. And then as we're talking about females, women and everything, um, if you can do that to another uh, woman, it's also great, um, you know, to help. Uh, you know, that that change do. So that's normally the, the tip we give um, instead of just, you know, putting your head down or, you know, you're just shy to recognize or you, you don't say, oh, OK, and then you move on. Don't do that. Um, give it back. Uh, and especially if it's another woman. Mm, thank you. And I think it's also about being present in that moment. You know, when somebody gives you, you know, says something good about you, you know, we can easily very very quickly say thanks and move on to the next thing but be present in that moment and have that conversation uh, so thank you for that can um can we now talk about perhaps privilege and how how are we putting that to work Ritika I'm going to come to you first on this because you and I have had I think a zillion conversations on privilege because we both I think have come from very similar backgrounds trodden on extremely difficult roads to be where we are here today and I said to you a couple of weeks ago that I feel I have privilege and that surprised you, right? Um, I feel that I have privilege because I am now using my platform of privilege to help young girls to be who they want to be. How, how did you interpret this conversation that we had a couple of weeks ago? You know, as as you rightly said, totally took me by surprise. The conditioning of the fact that I've had all my life to only break barriers as a woman, as a woman of color. I never saw myself, although, you know, we do this work and we mm. define privilege as, you know, something you don't have to think about. We define privilege as something that you cannot choose not to have. And so by that very different definition, I couldn't choose not to be born as a woman. I couldn't choose the color of my skin. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm, I'm, you know, proud, loud and proud about both of these aspects now, but it wasn't a privilege. And so I think I threw, you know, I, I sort of threw that question back in my head and redefined privilege because the privilege that you and I discussed is woman made. I don't want to use the word man made deliberately, but uh, you know, it's woman made or it's, uh, you know, human made. The fact that we are, you know, we are women of color that are now using the platform, our lived experiences, as painful as it is, to share those experiences, be vulnerable, be authentic, only in the hope to inspire and pave the way, only in the hope that some woman out there or someone out there will see that this journey is worth it and keep going on it. And so that, that privilege has been created with blood, sweat and hard work. 
So my question back is, is that really privilege or is that us creating our destiny? Because privilege is something that is handed over to you and you don't have to think about. And so I was battling with that. And as good as it feels to be in that position of power or privilege, whether I would call that privilege, I don't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it remains to be discussed further. <laughs> um, Joan, may I come to you next? Um, when we talk about privilege, um, I do believe that I'm privileged to privilege. We're privileged to be alive, we're privileged to be healthy, we're privileged to be in the roles that we are in. And as Rafiq said, we, we had to fight to get to where we are, so we don't see it as a privilege. But I, I've always seen myself as one of very few that's got to the position. I never thought in all my nursing career that I would, I'd end up being a chief nurse. And um, before I retired from the NHS, I didn't actually even think that was possible. I, my, my mentality is if there's something out there for you, just go for it and God will make the way for you. And often we are the ones that put the barriers in our own way. I remember even when I was going for my nurse consultant role, which was a big role at the time, I, I was told, well, why do you think that you're going to get it? There's other people just as or better than you that are not black that will get it. I said, it doesn't work like that. And because I've got faith in God and I believe in what I do, and I know once you believe in yourself and you know you've got the competencies and the abilities, confidence will take you to the level. Often we doubt ourselves. So if we doubt ourselves, other people will doubt us. But we have as much right as everybody else to be in the positions that we're in. We might, we might have fought to get there, but once we're there, we're there for a reason. And so we should enjoy that that position that we're in and not think that we owe it to anyone that because of anybody else to we think said we fought we, it wasn't easy nobody handed to us on the plate and we have as much right to be there as anybody else and so now that I've got that privilege I'm at the point of supporting other people so if I get to go to a meeting like if I was invited to Downing Street I'd always say can I bring a plus one with me and bring another colleague along that wouldn't have had that opportunity to be there so always supporting other people. If I'm going to a board meeting and there's a, a, a younger um, nurse that would never get that opportunity, I'd invite her to come along to shadow me for the day so that she can have access and be opened up to those different possibilities that might not have been there previously. So that's why I think we should use the positions that we have, the so-called privileged positions that we have taught and help other people to get to those positions too. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Joan. Oh, Kelly, should I come to you next? Yeah, I don't have much more to add, really. Um, I think, you know, what, what both Joan and, and Ratika have said, I, I, you know, really resonate with me on the fact that, you know, we've got to where we've got to because we've worked hard and, and broke barriers and, uh, and being able to use some of that privilege, um, you know, to help others is, you know, is what is what I'm doing is what clearly what a lot of the women on here are doing um you know I'm I'm not a woman of color but I come from a, a, a working class background you know the first person in my family to get a degree um and you know things like that you know you, you parents that push you to to do better than they did um and I think that you know we're all trying to do that aren't we we're all trying to to do better and do better for our kids and and uh, and all of that sort of stuff and I think you know I feel privileged in the sense of, you know, I, I look at Ukraine, I look at the situation over there and, and mm -hmm. I am appalled, uh, you know, by the situation and, and the women that, that are fleeing the country and leaving their partners, husbands, you know, family behind and taking their children and being strong or, or in fact staying and, uh, you know, and doing what they can to to do what they can in that situation. And, and, and I feel very grateful every day that I am not in that situation. Um, but again, how do we help uh, and how do we support in what is a, a horrific situation? It's not just Ukraine. And, you know, I know that there's uh, situations in war-torn countries all over the world. And, you know, it, it's that sort of stuff that, you know, you know, like Joan said, I'm, I, I feel very grateful every day for, for what I have and where I am. Uh, but how do I use that to, to support others? Thank you, Kelly. And yes, we are living through extremely turbulent times at the, at the moment. And cannot begin to fathom you know what the women and girls and, and all the many men in Ukraine are, are are going through and often I think 
sat here, what can I do? I don't know how I can help, but what can we do? Um, thank you that, thank you for that, Kelly. Diana, may I come to you next? Yeah, I think, again, I think it's hard for me, right? There's, there's no much thing because, um, and I think, you know, it was <clears throat> Misha, what John and, and Ritzika said on um, the privilege, but then what you do, you know, with it uh, in, in order to support. And then, of course, um, you know, asking sometimes the questions on, you know, grateful so for simple things like you know i have food in my table um i have you know a uh, condition to give nice things to my daughter um, um and even you know because not it's not questions to me like well, well, did you go to a private school or university is is even basic you know we, did you have the chance to study um mm -hmm. and not you know you had to maybe work since very young to support the family and couldn't go to school so uh sometimes people don't Think that privilege is something very high on status when it's not um and you know most of us yes even the ones hearing us today we are privileged in so many ways um and in, in others we had to battle our way to 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 prove something different um so it's how, it's not about um an issue or it's good bad wrong or right to have privilege or not but it's acknowledging it and i think ritika what you say it's it's amazing uh, so it's, it's, it's not a choice, um, but I think acknowledging it uh, and making sure that um, what are you doing with that, that you acknowledge, mm -hmm. uh, to support others that uh, most probably didn't have the choice to make a difference um, um, because they didn't, what, they're not given the resources or the tools or even the time or nothing, uh, you know, to build up upon something that you already have. Um, so it's all about, you know, us here today sharing and talking about it. It's already a big mm -hmm. start. Um, but when you think about in your family, your work, or any other forms you are, what you are doing to at least talk about this, because um, I think the acknowledgement is already a very big step. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you, Diana, for that. And I'm just going to share a comment that we've had in from one of our delegates, Nicola Hunt. She says, "My daughter asked me one day, where is the boss? When I pointed to the lady on the call." She said, no, where is the man in charge? That is when I started to change things. As a single mom, we have never had a man in the house. So it showed me our children are unconsciously influenced. So, our, you know, we are conditioned from a very, very kind of young age by the scenario, the situation that we are living in. Um, thank you for sharing that, Nicola. I'm just conscious of time. We're coming up to the last kind of five minutes of this panel. I've really enjoyed having this conversation with you, ladies, and I wish we could have done this in person. Maybe one day, maybe one day. Um, in closing, do you all have a thought or a question or a challenge that you'd like to leave our delegates with today? Can, yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, I'm going to say a few words and hold on to them. This is for the audience, a challenge, really. And the words are, this isn't just about you. Now, hang on for a second. The reason I say that is because every time we face a microaggression, every time we feel that we're not being paid as much as we should, every time we feel we need to stand up as an ally, it takes courage. It takes a lot of courage to do that in everyday situations. But the moment you remember that when you stand up, it isn't just about you. You're creating that ripple effect for generational change every single time you stand up for yourself. So the challenge today to the audience is do it. Do it for your sake and do it for generations to come because each time you stand up for yourself, you're making more of a difference than you can ever imagine. That's really powerful, Ritika. I've got I've got hair standing on the on my skin now. That's very powerful. Thank you. Um Joan. I would like, yeah. I would like to say go where you're celebrated. Don't stay where you're tolerated because anytime you're denigrated, 
you would never be appreciated. I do a lot of mentoring and coaching to um, nurses and adults who are being treated with a microaggression, gaslighting, really blatantly treated badly in the workplace. And many of them are suffering and staying in one position and are pretty rooted to the spot. And I think, I um, can't remember if it was Kelly that mentioned she left an environment where she wasn't thriving and going, growing. She went to a completely different area where she began to thrive and grow. And that's what we need to do. We need to just get up and go. We, we've got one life to live. So make the most of what you've got. And if, you, if anything's going on that you can't deal with, you can't cope with, don't have a mental breakdown and a melt, meltdown about it and lose all your confidence. Mm. Get mm. up and go and go where you will be celebrate, celebrated and appreciated. Thank you, Joan. Kelly? Wow, how do you follow some of those? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think for me, you know, um, I, I wish someone had said this to me 20 years ago um, when I was entering into, uh, uh, you know, my, my career and, and don't blend in. You don't need to blend in. Um, actually celebrate the fact that you're different, celebrate your uniqueness, uh, find your voice and be heard. And then I think for those that are in a position of um, privilege because they are recruiting or developing or promoting uh, individuals, you know, actually, again, you know, celebrate uniqueness. There's a whole world of difference between, um, you know, different and not good enough. Mm. Thank you, Kelly. Diana. Okay, so um, I, I think what I wanted to, to, to put as a challenge, but I think more on a reflection, uh, and I think Kelly mentioned that when, you know, when she was speaking. Um, uh, and for me, I, I, I also feel very, feel very sad when I still hear, you know, um, some of even my mentees that are females that say that, you know, the worst part that they um, ever went through uh, with was with other female leaders. Um, and then I think you all hear that thing that how competitive women are between us and how men, even when they don't even know each other, they just you know stick to others back. So I think this is a learning for us. Uh, so my reflection to the audience, especially you know the, 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 the females out there is think about that. Um, we, we need to reach our hands out to others, um, to other females to strive. So Healthy competition will all be, always be there, uh, men or women. But um, how many, you know, if you close your eyes today, uh, at work, at home, or whatever, how many other women are you are really helping to bring up with you? Bring them up with you. So just hearing, you know, saying that the worst uh, bosses ever were females to other females, it just breaks my heart um, because we are just so few in the top, so few. And if we do that, you know, what we expect from others. And then if you got there, um, and I'm sure you didn't get there by yourself, someone helped you, um, please stand your hands out and help other females to grow. Uh, so for me, it's a big reflection because sometimes I don't think we think about it. Uh, but what are you doing or saying to other females that report to you or that, you know, live with you? Um, stand your hand out. Uh, they need help. Um, so please, um, we need to start changing that. Um, I really don't want to hear, you know, those kind of things, um, but it happens. Um, so please, you know, reflect on how many you are helping today or how many are really helping to grow um, and replace you or be with you. Um, we are very few um, and we need a change. So think about that. Being the change that we want to see. Thank you all. Um, Diana, Kelly, Ritika, Joan, Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts today and championing success in all of its form. It's just been a real pleasure to have this conversation with you today. And let's make this into the everyday, right? All this that we do, let's make it our everyday. Um, thank you very much. Um, coming up next is a, is a networking break and we'll see you back in 15 minutes for the next panel, which is called the Equity Panel, ensuring that we leave no woman behind. Um, moderated by my colleague, Dylan Shimon, who is our learning experience designer. Thank you.